night on a Wednesday night, and uh, I applaud you for being out here. I know you're tired. Uh, I'm going to say the majority of you knew that Brother Keith wasn't in town, so and you still came anyway, so I appreciate that. Uh, for those of you that were here Sunday morning, you knew that I was uh, a little, you know, unsupervised. I didn't have as much. Well, you can tell tonight I am fully supervised. Um, they heard I tried to have a business meeting, and I guess Brother Keith rounded up the whole family, and uh, they said, we're not doing this again. So uh, I got the whole family on the front row tonight, so I'll be on my best behavior uh, as always. But if you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians tonight. Uh, that's where we're going to start, but uh, we're going to be turning a lot of different places, and this is kind of a um, uh, a different sermon than what I um, than how I normally preach and how I was taught to preach, um, and what we're all sort of used to here at, at Chief Cornerstone. Uh, this is not really uh, expositional, um, but it's just what the Lord had kind of what He's laid on my heart, and I tried to preach this Sunday morning, but He would not let me. So. Uh, but he turned me loose on it tonight, so um, I hope that uh, it encourages you. Um, but I normally don't title title sermons, but I put on the heading of, of this, and it was Five Blessings from Serving God. And uh, as we go through these tonight, I'm sure that you could, you could add some to this, um, but if I wanted to keep you here past 8 o'clock, I could have made it more. Um, you know, you can, you can count them pretty quick, and, um, but we're going to look at five tonight. Um, but what the Lord has just kind of laid on my heart, and, and uh, to build off of a little bit of uh, uh, what we talked about Sunday morning, is I hope and I want each and every one of you to know uh, just how important you are to the church and the vital role that you play in the church. No matter, <clears throat> excuse me, no matter what age, uh, no matter what ca- capacity that you serve in, or even if you think that right now. You are just someone who, who fills a seat, that this is just uh, your church. You really don't feel like you have a, a ministry that you're a part of or you have a job that you're doing. I want you to know that, that you are still important, that God has placed you here, and it's by no accident at all uh, that you are here and that you are a part of this church. And, um, but I, just, I hope you understand. I want you to understand that you're, that you're important and that you're vital uh, in this church. Uh, the same way you are to your family, uh, the same way that you're vital to to your employer, to your friends. Um, You have a job here at this church, and if you don't know what that role is, then I would encourage you to seek and ask God to show that to you. Um, There's a lot of churches that are dying. There's a lot of churches that are dying. This one's not. And it's not dying because I think the people understand their role. And it, but it takes all of us to do our part for the church to grow the way that God designed that to do. So you have a part here. But there is blessings in serving God. And, you know, a lot of people will ask, well, what, what is in it for me? Uh, what, what do I get out of this if I sell out to God? If I, Brother Clinton, if I decide to go all in for Christ, if I decide to be a servant of God, really, really what are my benefits? Because it looks like all these Christians look like they're all talking about how tired they are. There's some tired Christians in this church tonight, amen? You know, Blake asked me if, if, if anybody was behind him on the way here, and I looked, and he said no, and he said, well, tell me when my rear end shows up. So, you know, as I was shaking hands, I kind of almost saved him for last, and I just told him, Brother Ricky, just let it in the door. He was, he was told. He was here. There's some tired Christians in here. Um, you know, there's some Christians that, you know, that get beaten down that, you know, you're in storms right now, you're in trials right now. But when you look at our Christian walk and our Christian life as a whole, uh, I think you'll see tonight that there are some blessings that we receive when we are a servant of Christ. And so we're going to start reading tonight in Ephesians chapter 3, or um, four, chapter 4, I'm sorry, and we're going to read 11, 12, and 13 And then we're going to turn through some different spots. But this is where the Lord just put me right off the bat. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now those sounds like the main roles in the church there. It says in verse 12, For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying or for the building up of the body of Christ, till we all... 
So you may have not fit in verse 11, and you may have not, you know, you may have not, not, not found yourself in verse 12, but verse 13 has just included all of us. Amen? And it says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man or a mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's pray tonight. Father, we do love you. And God, I stand in need of you tonight, God. And Lord, I pray that you will just, uh, Lord, that you will speak through me. And God, I pray that I will, uh, Lord, I will speak the words that you would have me to speak. And God, I pray that it, it lands on the hearts and the lives of, of, your, of your church tonight, God. Lord, I pray that we will be obedient to do what the Word has, has called us to do and what the Word tells us to do. Father, I pray that you be with those in our church body that are, that are hurting and struggling tonight, God. Lord, we lift up Tommy Stamps to you. Uh, God, you know the troubles that he's having with his heart, God. And um, Lord, I pray that this medication that they put him on yesterday, God, will, will help him and and uh, Lord, get him kind of leveled out. But Lord, we we lift up his heart cath on Friday to you right now, and God, I pray that you'll just be in the midst of all that. Uh, Lord, we lift up uh, we lift up Miss Rickman to you right now, God, and we lift up Richard and all of his sisters. Uh, God, as they're there with Miss Linda, and God, I pray that uh, Lord, you'll just comfort that family right now. Uh, Lord, you'll wrap your arms around them. You'll let them know, uh, Lord, how much you love them. Uh, Father, I pray that they know how much this church loves them. And um, God, I pray that we as a church body will just reach out to those that are hurting among us, God. And, and Lord, look for opportunities to serve and look for opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we love you and thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So there is some blessings from serving God. Can anybody testify to that? There's some blessings. And, and so the first one that the Lord kind of showed me as I was studying through this is that serving Christ allows us to discern and it allows us to develop spiritual gifts. And so I want you to turn with me real quick to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to do some turning because I, I could explain all this to you, but God is a lot better explainer than I am, and so we're just going to use the Word of God to get our point across. Amen? So it says in... in a, in chapter, in chapter 12, in verse 1, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now if we were in youth on a Sunday night and I came across this, I would tell them that the Bible is telling us that he doesn't want us to be stupid. But I won't tell you that. We'll just go ignorant. But deep down inside, I hope you know what I mean. Okay? But it says, I do not want you to be ignorant. He wants us to be informed. He wants the church body to know what is going on. He doesn't want to, to hide this from us. And so he says in verse 2, You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. He's talking about this mute, uh, the mute idols or silent idols that, you know, they were just statues there. They didn't, they didn't make a sound. They didn't talk back. But he, called, he, he labeled them as dumb here. However you were led. Verse 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 says, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So church, did you see that, that in verse five or in verse four where it says there's diversities of gifts, it says, but it's a different it says, it says of the same spirit. Church, there's various kinds of gifts, amen. And if we were to, to go through all that and, and we've done this I, I know twice uh, since I have been a part of Chief Cornerstone where we've taken the spiritual gift test and some people have done that in Sunday school and you've gone through that and, and you know what your gifts are. Um, you know, you'd really know what, they're, what, they, what they are not, you know. Um, but hopefully you know what your spiritual gift is, and they're all different. And they have to be all different because we all have to work together. We've all, we're all in this together. God is using each and every one of us to grow His church. So He's put us there, but He says there's diversities of gifts, but He said it's the same Spirit. Then look what He says. He says there's differences 
of ministries, he said, but it's the same Lord. And he says in verse 6, and there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. See, my ministry is different than Brother Keith's ministry. And Brother Matt's ministry is different than, than my ministry. But it works all together. And our ministries are different than, than Brother Bobby's ministry. And it's different than, than Brother George. Brother George is kind of lucky he's got it all. He can play the piano, he can sing, and he can preach. You know, I'm struck out on all three of those, but I'm up here, you know. I'm just using my gift and praying God can just do something with it. All right? But, you, you know, there's different gifts. That, but God orchestrates all that and He puts that together to, to grow His church and take care of it. God knows. God knew exactly who was going to be here tonight. God knew who was going to be here on Sunday. He knew who was going to be here Sunday night. And He knows who's going to be here this Sunday. And you know what? The person that walks in our church Sunday morning that has a need, guess who God's going to put there? He's going to put the person in place that has gone through a similar situation. He's going to put the person in place who maybe just finished dealing with what they're going through. Maybe that's something that they've, that they've studied and they know. God does all that. Why? Because there's diversities of gifts. There's differences of ministries, but it's the same Spirit and it's the same Lord. And then the last thing he says when he says in verse 6, he says there's diversities of activities. And church, our church is all about the activities. I mean, summer is here, which you guys know it's vacation Bible school, and it's church camp, and we just finished our egg hunt, and, you know, there's ladies' nights, and there's men's prayer breakfasts, and there's uh, grief share, and there's divorce care, and there's surrendering the secret. I mean, do you realize where our church is? We talked about this Sunday. You have to drive to get here. It's not like I just, you know, I find it on accident. You don't. You have to mean to do that. But God has used the different gifts of people in His church to form and do all these different activities. You know, and as soon as summer comes out, and you're thinking, all right, I survived Bible school, I survived church camp, and you think we got a break, well, what, what do you see? You see Chris Crawford with a binder at church on a Sunday morning. And what do you do? You avoid him as long as you can. Because you know, oh, something's coming, you know, I want to wait. I just want one of those parts where I just kind of walk through the back. You know, a lot of people have started in the back, you know, but you've worked your way into a role now, so now you know to hide from Chris when he comes. But it's different of activities, but it's the same God works all in all. Church, we've seen, we've seen kids saved through vacation Bible school. You know, we've, we've, we've seen kids saved through, through church camp and you know, we've taken kids to kids' camp, and you know, we've seen kid, we've seen all kinds of people saved through through Judgment House, and we've seen, you know, we, we may not have seen it in our own um, sanctuary here, but there's been kids that have come to know Christ that were impacted by our Easter egg hunt, and man, the families that we we reached out to this year with with how um, you know Jake and Heather did that, God just puts things. And people, and when you use those gifts, what happens? Then great blessings come to the church. But we get to be involved in that. We still give the praise and credit to God, but God lets us experience that. And so, as he says in the end, in, in the end here in verse 7, he says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So you know what? It means that whatever ministry it is, that I, I, I'm gaining from your ministry how you serve the Lord, and by you doing your part, guess what that does? That profits me. Well, it's, it's easy to see that uh, from when Brother Keith puts his time in to, to preach or when, you know, when your Sunday school teacher puts that time in and you get something from the sermon or you get something from the lesson or, or you get something from the song, it's easy to see that profit. But sometimes we, we, for, we, we overlook just what someone's testimony at the end of a service will do. Because that's something that we were going through that we didn't know anybody else had experienced anything like that until they brought it up. So church, your gift is a benefit to this church and it says it's a profit to all. The second one that we see is we get to, we get to, to see Christ do miracles. Now you've got the miracles and, 
And, and I wrote a bunch of these down, but I think I'm already staying on some points longer. But if you go through the Gospel of Luke and you go through the, you know, the Gospel of John, you start in chapter 2 and you see him turn water into wine, and you see the feeding of the 5,000, and you see the, him raise Lazarus from the dead, and you see the man born blind that he healed, and, and you find the man with the withered hand that Jesus touches his hand and his hand comes. You find when Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus and Jesus puts it back on. You see the resurrection. We see the big miracles of the Bible. There's little miracles of the Bible. You know, you see the woman at the well. We see how Jesus changed her life. But that was a miracle, what it was to that woman. You know, we see the woman who just reached out and touched the hem of the garment. I just, I just had to touch it. Jesus knew it. He turned around. Something had left him. Was that really that much of a miracle? It was to her. You know, you, you tell your story of, of salvation. It may not be a miracle to somebody else. But man, when you know, when you realize how dirty, rotten, nasty of a person that you really are and what God saved you from and what He brought you out of and the greatest part that I have to look at too is how dirty, rotten of a person I still am and He keeps me saved. That He holds that. That He saved me to my uttermost. And so we see that that's that's a miracle in my life. We've seen miracles here in this church. We've seen people healed. We've seen people that were, you know, that were sick and, and, and struggling and, and God raised them up. You know, and, and a lot of times we'll get sad when maybe, you know, you, you think of, you know, when an, a circumstance happens and, and maybe it doesn't feel like God healed them here on this earth, but what did He do? He healed them in heaven. Like Tony Evans said about his wife, he's either going to heal my wife here or he's either going to heal her there. You know, it takes a, it takes a big man to say that. But he trusted God, but it was a miracle in his life. And seeing his wife pass from, what is this place called? This is earth, and passing to heaven, that's a miracle. I mean, when you think that somebody lays their, their head to rest here on this earth, and instantly they're in heaven, that's a miracle, church. So we've seen that, but if you're not using your gift, if you're not if you're not being part and you're not in the fellowship of the church and you're not in the Word and you're not spending time with Him, then you're going to overlook that. You're just going to look for the big things and not realize all the little things that Jesus does for you throughout the day. You ever be driving somewhere and you're like, I don't remember stopping at that light. That's a miracle because maybe you didn't. <laughs> How did I get to right here? I don't remember turning. You know, I know I, I just went through the you know three stoplights. He might have just had his hand of protection. You might have lived through a miracle and you didn't even know it. Do you see all that? And so it's miracles in our own lives. It's not always the, the big ones that we see in the Bible, church, but we could all testify of, of miracles that God has done from here uh, from us here on this church. I mean, when you when you look at our church, and again, we talked about where our location is. And we just mentioned all the things that God does through our church. That's, that's a miracle. I mean, church, there's, there's church di- dying all over. There's churches on Wednesday nights with two or three people in them right now. There's Sunday morning crowds with five or six people in there. Churches are dying. But this church is just growing. You're, 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 you're witnessing. You're seeing. But more importantly, you are a part of that miracle if you're doing your part. The third one is church is we get to experience the joy and peace from the obedience. Now you always hear Brother Key say, he says this quite often, he says disobedience disobedience brings conflict, obedience brings what? Blessing. I want you to turn with me real quick to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. I may have to read it off the screen. I found my, that's, that part has come out of my Bible, and I had to make sure that it was in there and that I had it. Don't offer to buy me a new Bible. I like this one. First Peter, that's what I'm talking about. First Peter chapter four, verses ten and eleven. That's not it. That's James. 
I'm going to read it off there. It says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. What's he telling us to do? It's not just in our best interest to use our gift. It's a command. It's a command. It says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles or the utterances of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we see that. It says, minister to one another. Church, we need what you have. I need what you have. And you may not want to acknowledge this, but you need what I have. Say, I don't think so. You do. Bible says it. You've got to take it. Why? Because it's supposed to be good for you. If I'm doing it the right way, then it's good for you. And if you're doing it the right way, it's good for you. So guess what? Your personal walk, your relationship with Jesus Christ, more people depend on that than just you. More people depend on that than your household. When you neglect to study and read and meditate and pray about on the Word of God and spend time with Him, you're not just struggling. You're not just hurting your relationship. You're hurting mine. When you, th- when you think about that, that there's, there's, not, there's an entire church riding on your relationship with Christ. Why? Because He commanded us to, to use it. We need what you have, but also realize that it's God's supplies. It said in the middle of that verse, let Him do it as with the ability which God supplies. So understand, I'm not doing this on my own. I didn't walk up to this pulpit on my own power. I can promise you that because anybody else empty when they came in tonight? My clothes were ironed and hanging up and ready for me at 6 o'clock. Actually, like 5 till 6. They were ready. And I looked at them and I was fixing to get dressed and I said, hey, I'm going to go lay on the couch. Wake me up at 6.30. I never take naps. I was tired. I was empty. And I was like, on the way here, it was just like, Lord, I'm still empty. That 30-minute nap kind of just made me mad. Anybody else know where I'm coming from? (laughs) If I can wake up on my own, I am the happiest person alive. Saturday mornings, Sunday mornings, 5.20, if, if no alarm goes on, I can wake up. I'm good to go. I'll get up going on trying to disturb anybody. But if I got to hear that alarm go off, that is awful. Anybody, anybody, everybody, know, everybody knows where I'm coming from right there. But it's God that supplies it. God is who has given you that gift. God, God is who has blessed you with that gift. And so God gets all the glory. That in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Church, if what you're doing is trying to get your own self-gain through what Jesus has given you or allowed you to, to, to hold on to while you're walking this face of life, then, then we're doing it wrong. Then we've messed up. Then, we're, then he's, he's going rota- to remove that from us. He's going to have to chasten us. He's going to have to discipline us. Why? Because God is going to get the glory because he's the only one that's owed it. It's not about us. It's not about us, church, but man, we, we want it to be sometimes, don't we? Philippians 4.17. I have this. It's all still attached good, so I won't have to read off that screen. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 17. I just got to be able to find it. It says this, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all in abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. I don't think that was the verse I was trying to read. It wasn't. That was Philippians 4.17, though, wasn't it? Well, that's what I got wrote down, but that's not where I was trying to get. Um... Because out next to it, I have, when we do it God's way, He gives us the peace. And I believe I was looking, I, I thought I had written down the, word, the verse that, I think maybe is it 4 7. I just threw a little one. That is a 7. 
Let's go read, let's read verse 7. How about we go there? Is that all right? And, it's, see, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. I just got to be able to read my own handwriting. But when we do it God's way, church, He gives us peace. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I like having peace in my life. I like to be able to lay my head down and have peace. Because I can think back to those years when I was living in sin and I was hiding sin. And, and man, you were just, you, your, your head would be laying on the pillow and, and anybody else just ever, you, you were just scared. You were nervous about the outcome of, of what might come about that because you weren't doing it God's way. You were doing things on your own. But it's like when God changes that, then it's like you can lay that head down at night and you can just be gone. It makes Corey so mad because she said, I can fall asleep so fast. Peace. <laughs> I say that to her and I give her a little sign as I close my eyes. Just peace. I'm just telling you, if you haven't tried it, it's fantastic. If you haven't tried it, it's fantastic. But it only comes when you're doing it God's way and you're doing His will. If you turn with me real quick to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, when we, are, when we are experiencing the blessings of God from being sold out to Him, then we will experience fellowship by, by being surrounded by fellow believers. And church, you hear Brother Keith say it, in this church, uh, I'm going to throw a, a real visual out here to you that you'll be able to experience here in just a second. But you, you get excited when you get to be around fellow believers. That it does lift you up and it does encourage you and you can be tired. And it's okay to be tired when you walk up here, when you walk in here. It's okay to come to church just feeling beaten and broken. And the thing is, you, you made it. Guess what? You had to take some effort because you didn't just get out of your car and stumble in here. You had to climb some steps. Now, thankfully, when we get over here, we might not have to climb some steps. We can just ramp it. But when you do that, you still have to make a turn. There's still some effort into that. But it's okay if you, if you came in tonight and you were, you were beaten. It's okay if you came in tonight and you were broken. It's okay because you came. Why? Because you understand that, hey, well, I, I can get something from God. I, I, I can experience the blessings that He has for me, but I can also be encouraged by God's people. Now, Sunday morning, you know, and you, you hear Brother Keith talk about this, that this is the fellowship in this church ever. I had to make sure I didn't say any cuss words in front of my kids right then. The fellowship in this church ever. He says that. Sunday morning... We had a pretty good-sized crowd, and I was standing back there shaking hands, and I shook hands with about 20 people in 30 minutes. Why? And you, but you looked around, and the church is still full. They're all just talking to one another. And tonight, we will get out, and the people will still be around. Why? Because you're fellowshipping with other believers. Why? Because you need that. And they need that, and that's part of the growing church. But Hebrews chapter four and ver or chapter ten and verse twenty four says, "And let us consider one another, in order to stir up love and good works." Verse twenty five says, "Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting or lifting up one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching." He's like, "We need to do it more because Jesus is coming back." We need to exhort, we need to lift up uh, uh, those around us. Why? Because, you know, when you go out to work tomorrow, you're going you're, you're to be around people that I'm not going to be around. You're going to be in a battle that I'm not in. And I'm going to be around people that you aren't going to be in. So it's not your job to reach those people. It's not your job to win those people. That's my job. Your job is to reach the people that you are going to encounter tomorrow. But he tells us in that verse 24, he says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love. He says, love and good works. Now the book of John, Gospel of John, John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. I told you we were going to turn a lot, and that's because Jesus says it better than I can. But John chapter 13, in verse 34 and 35, he says, a new commandment, red letters, who's talking? Jesus. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. 
And look at what he says here. He says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So he tells us in the book of Hebrews, the, the writer here that I think is Paul, he tells us that we need to stir up in one another, stir up love. Well, that's funny. Where did he get that from? He got it from Jesus. What does Jesus tell us? He told us to love one another. When you come into the church, church body, I hope that you feel loved. And I think that they do, and I think that's why our church grows. Because if you walk into this church and you don't feel love, then you're not sticking around. You're not going to stick around. But you walk in, somebody walks in on a crowded church and a family gives up their seat, and you're, or you scooch down, or, you know, whatever, you know. It seems like a little act, but to them, that, that could be the love. That, that's the love they needed to stay. Because we don't know the battle it took to get them here this morning. I mean, visiting a new place is intimidating enough. But he tells us to love one another. And then he says, good works. Now, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 talks about the good works. So we're supposed to stir up in each other love. And then Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. So, we're not going to hit on that very long, but you know we're not saying, he's going to tell us, and that not of yourselves is to get a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we're not working up anybody's salvation. We're not trying to earn any kind of extra reward in heaven, you know, to add on to our salvation. No, because we're saved by grace through faith. Not of these works, but what do these works do? It says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship, Created. You mean tell me all of us were created? Every single one of us. That Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, had a relationship with us before he placed us in the womb of our mother. Well, how do you know that? Well, Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So I can just picture me up there as little baby Clint. I'm bald again. And God told me. And he, he knows me, and he's putting all these things, you know, about me. And he's like, hey, he's cranking the dial, saying this is how tall you're going to be. And he's punching in the weight. This is going to be the max weight. I wish he'd have dropped her down. <laughs> but he didn't. Hey, I'm not fun-sized. I'm God-sized. He knew me. He made me. But he had this relationship with me. And then you know what? When he knew everything there was to know about me in that creation, then you know what? He blessed my mom and he gave me to her. And she's like, blessed? <laughs> That's right. He blessed her and he gave her, he gave me to her. He knew me. So this God created us in Christ Jesus well, what did he do? He created us for good works, church. We're not saved by it, but we are to carry on good works. He did the good work on Calvary. We carry on God's good works here because that's why we were created. Why, why do I commit myself to the church? Because that's why God created you. Why do I use my gift in the church? Because that's why God created you. Then when you think about it, the sole purpose you were here to love people, carry out your, your good work. That's why, that's why he put us here, church. Outside of us to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but we do that because we were created. The last thing, and we're going to finish here in the book of Ephesians tonight, but it says uh, the last thing is he increases our faith and he increases our knowledge. In Ephesians chapter 3, if you look at verse 19, it says to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Why do I go all out for God? Why, why, why do I serve him? Why do I use what I have? It's because when God gives out of his abundance, doesn't it make you feel a little shame for not giving everything you have? You ever pray about something or you get worked up about something or, you know, nobody else probably ever gets anxious about anything. 
Do you ever get anxious about anything, no, and get it all worked up, and then God just takes care of it, fixes it, and get, pours out of his abundance? Doesn't it hurt to know that you doubted God? I mean, there, there's some shame there. Why? Because I doubted the fact that God loved me. I doubted how, how much he loved me. I doubted that he could take control of this situation. But church, when we're serving him and we're trusting him, then it says, it says that we are going to be able to, to know the love of Christ. And that love of Christ, what's it going to do? It's going to pass knowledge. And it says that you are going to be filled. I don't know about you, but I like being full. That's why I love a good buffet. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Why? Because you can eat until you are full. And then you get dessert, right? <laughs> but you eat until you're full. Why do you want to be full? Because, well, I paid for this. I'm going to get all, I'm going to get all I want. I'm, 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 going to get all, all, I'm loosening a button on the belt buckle. That's what I'm doing. But I like being full because I feel like I've accomplished something. I'm walking out of there with my head held high. Sweat underneath my eyes from all the meat, but I I feel accomplished. You have come from their their abundance, but church, when, what God, what the Bible says is that He's going to He says He's going to fill us with all the fullness of God, and then it says, "Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think." Church, that's that's why you serve God. You give God everything you have. You serve God with your whole heart. You use the gifts, the talents that Jesus has given you with everything that you have, not to get any credit, but we do that to get closer in our relationship with God. We do that to, to, to let God pour out the abundance of love and grace and mercy that He has on us. We, we do that to be able to lay our heads down at night and have that peace. We do that because, hey, the people in my church body, they need me. And see, there's a lot of people that come into church week in and week out that think they're just sitting in that chair and they just leave and they did their civil duty. They did God the favor that week because they came to church. But they couldn't be farther from the truth. Because the Word of God says that the butt that's in that seat is important as the butt that's in that seat. Amen. And it says that, that gift, no matter if that's the gift that, 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 that's preaching or that's the gift that was teaching Sunday school, is same as the gift that, that gave the, the little boy and the little girl cookies and Kool-Aid during vacation Bible school. Why? Because we never know what those kids went through that day. You know what? I thought it was awesome when our church started feeding everybody at Vacation Bible School. I mean, we're not, it's not just, I mean, I still, you know, I love the great Kool-Aid, but when you're drinking great Kool-Aid with an A&B barbecue sandwich, you know, it's pretty good. But those people are important. And to that little kid, that gift of them serving at the time until they come to that knowledge of understanding is more important than the kid t than the guy or the girl teaching their lesson that night. See, you're, you're important, church. Every every role, every job here is important, and I hope you understand that. And I hope you understand that if you're here and you're a member or you're you're visiting and you're thinking about joining this church, I hope that you will. But I hope that you'll come to work, and I hope that you'll come to do your part, because God's growing and He's growing this church. And if you'll just get in His Word and you'll seek His face and you'll spend time in prayer, then you'll have to hold on. And you'll have so much sleep at night because you'll be laying that head down with all that peace and just sleeping right through the night. And you'll get there fast. Why? Because it's peace. And that's what God wants you to have tonight. And I don't know why God laid that on my heart tonight. I, I know that this is Wednesday night and you know this is the, the backbone of the church, the, the hardest working and when you see Vacation Bible School roll around, these are the people that are working. And you see church camp, and these are the people that, that are there. 
But maybe there's somebody in here tonight who just feels like that they have, can't find a place or don't have a place. And maybe you don't feel important in the kingdom of God. I just want you to know that you are. That you are. And you're so important. And if it would have just been you, then God still would have sent Jesus to pay the price for your sins because you're loved that much. For God so loved the world. You got to put yourself in that world. Let's pray tonight. Father, we love you tonight. And we thank you and praise you, God, for all that you